paper presentation right now. Uh, may I please invite our convener, Dr. Jayesh Nayak, to please approach. And uh, our chairperson, Dr. Gaurav Vagmari, to please approach the front and have a seat. Uh, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. H.R. Junjunwala, to speak about his topic, uh, an innovation technique for revision cup. Good afternoon. Thank you for the Bombay Orthopedic Society to allow me this uh, presentation. Thank you. This is absolutely an innovative technique, cup into cup, for revision cup. Uh, this is an example of a 52-year-old male underwent Austin Moore orthoplasty for fractured neck femur in 1994 in Madhya Pradesh. Austin Moore failed in four years. So in 1998, it was converted into a cemented THR. That also failed in five years. Very implant osteolysis, you can see here. the osteolysis and uh, so revision uncemented long stem because there was a lot of osteolysis here it, the revision was used the long stem processes with uncemented multi-hole socket because we could fix up with multi multiple screws that was done in 2003 and for 17 years, it was uneventful recovery. In April 2020, he presented with pain, limping gait, difficulty in standing from a sitting position. And on clinical examination, pain on active and terminal passive moments of the hip. Radiologically, cup looked stable and stem showed some proximal osteolysis. No systemic complaints, uh, CBC, ESR, CRP, all levels were normal, le normal limits. And then we decided to open the joint and we found that the cup the step was found to be stable with good distal hold. Sorry. Uh, poly was worn out. Poly was worn out here and there was a fracture. The metal shell for this cup was very stable. Frozen section, no infection. With Tribological advancement, most of the companies modified their design of the poly over the years. And therefore, there was a dilemma, what to do now? This poly was not available. So, question was whether to revise the whole assembly, shell as well as the poly, or only do the poly. So the bailout was difficult to have an option. In view of the extensive nature of the surgery, also to prevent the blood and the bone loss, as the patient is now 78 years and he had comorbidity also, we tried to bail out with a simple and innovative technique of the cup into cup. Uh, from the cup, the shell, this is a shell of multi-hole. We have removed the cup, put the cement, and put a cemented cup. 
and fix it up. And uh, cementation of the uh, Elite Poly 47 millimeter size, well fixed and stable, other uh, outer cementless shell of the 54. This, this shell was 54, this was 47, so there was about 3 millimeter cement around the cup. Head was changed uh, with a longer neck to get a better stability of the hip. And uh, post-operative patient walking pain-free pain with a stick support on the day five. This is two and a half years follow-up. Patient is walking about without any aid and he could sit and stand very well without pain. The stem was same. Gradually this osteolytic area in the stem also healed up and uh, the cup was doing very well. The highlights of this uh, technique is, this technique has not been described in the literature at all. It is a viable, cost-effective, better alternative to the conventional revision when only poly has to be changed. Same company's poly is not available. This cup, a to cup innovative technique, shortens the operative time, reduces blood and bone loss, and overall perioperative morbidity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, may I invite Dr. Pooja Banwal for functional outcomes of surgical management of lumbar canal stenosis? We take questions now or later on? Sir, uh, once. Uh, uh, questions. Questions once the this is over or we can take it right now also, sir. No problem. Any uh, questions for uh, sir? I sir, I have a question. Uh, what is the role of MRI to diagnose aseptic loosening? Because in X-ray we could see that the there was some osteolysis around the femoral stem, but clinically the stem was well fixed. So any role of preoperative MRI to see any osteolysis? Yeah, you can see the osteolysis as such also in the plain X-ray yeah. plus CT scan we have done which shows osteolysis in the proximal part, but there was no osteolysis in the distal part, and therefore we can we took it uh, that the stem is very stable and even when we opened up there was no uh, instability of the stem at all. Okay. And sir, uh, is there any role of teriparatide in cases of suspected aseptic loosening or osteolysis? Sorry, I could not get it. Uh, teriparatide injection, parathyroid hormone in case of aseptic loosening suspected joint pain after, you know, uh, no, TTHR. There, there was joint pain while sitting and walking, which has, uh, after the poly was changed, the cup into cup position was given. Okay. There was no pain at all. After. He could sit, he could walk, he could do everything. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. My topic is functional outcome of surgical management of lumbar canal stenosis. My study compares the role of uh, various factors, including duration of symptoms, instability, and neuro deficit present in patients in affecting the outcome of surgical management via various modalities. Uh, for my study, I have used a JOA score, which is basically Japanese Orthopedic Association score for lumbar spine. It involves subjective symptoms, objective findings, and affection of daily activities. So uh, this is the thing that I found most useful for my study. Uh, my study is a retrospective observational study that, that was done in a single tertiary care center with a follow-up duration of 18 months. Patients with uh, age more than 40 years with claudication distance less than 200 meters were included. Patient with any prior traumatic vertebral injury, any pri uh, prior lumbar spine surgery or radiological LCS with no clinical symptoms were excluded from the study. 
30 patients uh, were selected randomly and were preoperatively assessed based on JOA score questionnaire. They were operated via various modalities uh, suiting the patient based on their clinical radiological status and patients were evaluated post-operatively at 1, 6 and 12 months and then their JOA score was calculated at each time. Patients were then compared on the recovery of quality of life based on recovery rate on based on various fa factors including instability, duration of symptoms and neurological deficit. Recovery rate was calculated based on the formula uh, using difference between post-op and pre-op JOA score and patients were categorized into four groups uh, including excellent, good, fair and poor. The modalities of surgeries included laminectomy, discectomy, uh, laminectomy with or without discectomy, with or without PLIF with instrumentation. Uh, I would like to discuss a few cases that, I, uh, uh, that were done uh, for the study. First is a 60-year-old female with uh, uh, back pain, more than leg pain for more than uh, 12 months. Instability was present. Uh, the patient had no neurological deficit. Uh, MRI showed significant canal compression and preoperative JOA score was 12. Patient was operated using uh, interbody fusion with instrumentation uh, using rods and screws and was fo uh, follow up x-ray of 12 months is shown. Post operative JOA score was 26 and the recovery rate as calculated by the formula was 82.35 which was falling in the good category. This is my second case, a 57 year old male with uh, back pain more than leg pain for 10 months uh, on examination he had a plantar flexion on the left side 4 by 5, rest neurology was normal. Patient had an instability as is shown in flexion extension x-ray. The MRI shows significant canal compression with uh, hypertrophy of ligamentum flavum and effusion at the facet joint. Preoperative JOA score based on questionnaire was found to be 14. Patient was operated using uh, with laminectomy with uh, augmented screws and rods since the patient was osteoporotic and was followed up for 12 months. Post-operative JOA score at the end of 12 months was 25. However, the plantar flexion remained on the left 4 by 5. The recovery rate was 78.95% which was falling in the good category. Based on my uh, uh, study, uh, the results were the patients with lesser duration of symptoms had significant improvement in recovery rate as compared to the pre-op uh, JOA score. Patient with preoperative instability did significantly better. However, patients with neurodeficit did not have uh, significant improvement as compared to those without neurodeficit. Uh, however, it is to be noted that none of the patients that were chosen for the study had any functional loss in sensation or power. To conclude my study, uh, patients with pre-op instability and short duration of symptoms before surgery were more satisfied with the surgery and patients with or without neuro deficit did not have any significant difference in recovery score. So my study suggests that for uh, patients with lumbar canal stenosis after a fair trial of conservative treatment has been done, uh, it suggests, uh, it advises patients early surgery, particularly for pre-op instability so that they have significant improvement in the recovery rate. However, my study has been done on a small scale. Uh, the patients included were only 30. So, uh, uh, larger study needs to be done to apply the uh, results of the study to a generalized population. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we take questions, right? Yeah. Any questions? just wanted to ask you about your indications because you had classified into four categories with without relief so both the cases were almost a similar with um, mild instability having a grade one listhesis so in one you had done a relief the other one you had done only instrumentation without relief so what were your criteria to differentiate or indications for your relief sir so, uh, for patients with uh, uh, instability we added instrumentation the patients we uh, did discectomy with a, with a, a large protruded disc for the, uh, those we did PLIF. King is what is your indication to do interbody fusion in first case, right, sir? Yeah. And you didn't do the interbody fusion in the second case. Both showed the instability. Both showed instability. 
sir, for uh, first patient, there was significant canal compression with a large disc protruding in the uh, uh, canal. Uh, the second patient did not have such a large disc protruding in the canal, so discectomy, a lot of disc material was removed for the first case. So the, uh, that is why we had to add uh, interbody fusion for that particular patient. We did not need to remove a lot of disc for the second case uh, since there was not uh, significant protrusion. So we did not do, we just went ahead with instrumentation for that patient. How long did you follow up the instrumentation case? Only where you, where you, where you did the instrumentation? Uh, sir, uh, all the patients were followed up for 12 months. And uh, is there any decrease in back pain in the second case? Uh, so there was significant decrease in back pain since patient also had a lot of instability, uh, pain due to instability. Instrumentation relieved a lot of back pain for both the patients. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Next talk is by Dr. Nandini Iyer about analysis of current trends in spinal TB with a focus on functional outcomes in MDR TB patients. Good afternoon, respect chairperson and uh, all my colleagues. Uh, today I'll be talking about the analysis of current trends in spinal tuberculosis with a focus on functional outcomes in MDR TB patients. A 17-year-old female had presented with complaints of back pain, deformity, and bilateral lower limb weakness since two years. She was diagnosed with D1012 spondylodiscitis, um, probably due to Cox, and started with um, Category 1 AKT empirically at her village in Uttar Pradesh. About 10, to, uh, 10 months through this Category 1 treatment, there was no improvement clinically or radiologically, and she finally presented to us uh, after about eight months of Category 1 AKT in December 2021, a CT-guided biopsy was done, which was found to be positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. It was found, also found to be uh, resistant to all first-line AKT, along with fluoroquinolones such as moxifloxacin and levofloxacin. A diagnosis of um, extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis ha had been made after this. However, as per re more recent guidelines, um, Cases that are resistant to all first-line drugs along with fluoroquinolones are classified as pre-XDR and an added <coughs> resistance to idaquiline or, lin or linezolid is required for a XDR diagnosis. So the patient was accordingly started on sensitive AKT. Five months through this, she came back with improved neurology but progressively increasing incapacitating back pain and a deformity which had worsened to, to now 50 degrees of a Cobb's angle. This was her radiological picture then. She was then managed with um, surgical intervention and a complete correction in deformity had been achieved after posterior instrumentation, decompression and deep diamond was done. This is her um, radiological um, and clinical pictures three months through follow-up. And she had achieved full functional recovery and is now able to do all her activities of daily living without the requirement of a brace also and is completely pain-free. The sensitive uh, AKT that had been started pre-operatively was continued into the post-operative period as well. A two-and-a-half-year-old female had presented with back pain, bilateral lower limb weakness with upper motor neuron signs and deformity. A diagnosis of D8 to 10 spondylodiscitis was made. This child had been started on empirical AKT outside but had defaulted in the treatment and then she presented to us with worsening neurology. She was managed surgically with a decompression, debridement. This is her intraop uh, picture and she was managed with uh, instrumentation using a customized pediatric heart shield along with sublaminar wires that was spanned from D5 to L2 level. Post-operatively, there was an, uh, a, com a correction in deformity with a complete recovery neurologically and she was supported on a total body contact brace. The intraop samples were found to be positive for uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis with rifampicin resistance and uh, a multidisciplinary approach was taken along with the consultation of a chest TB physician and a pediatrician and she was planned to be started on betaquilin with uh, sensitive AKT for 18 to 20 months. A 15-year-old female had presented to us with back pain and constitutional symptoms. A diagnosis of D10 and L1 spondylodiscitis was made. At that time, an in the CT-guided biopsy that was done was found to be inconclusive. However, empirical category 1 AKT was started. She had failed to follow up and then followed directly six months later with progressive uh, worsening and uh, weakness in bilateral lower limbs and a complete uh, power of zero despite six months of taking category 1 AKT. And as, as you can see here, there's a complete uh, 
collapsed in her D10 and L1 vertebral bodies. This patient was then managed surgically with decompre uh, decompression, debridement, and instrumentation, along, which, along with two cage insertions. And the intraoperative sample was found to be uh, positive for MT MTP with rifampicin resistance uh, detected. She was started on appropriate uh, uh, AKT for MDRTB in the postoperative period. And this is her functional recovery with, uh, on a brace three months through follow up. We conducted a retrospective analytical study at tertiary care centers in the city. Ten patients were selected, all of whom had spinal tuberculosis that was also drug resistant and, was, uh, and required surgery. However, patients who did not have any drug resistant tuberculosis and who could be conservatively managed were not included. The surgical principles followed were decompression, debridement and instrumentation. All of these patients had received sensitive uh, um, MDR AKT regime at some point, either in the initiated in the pre-operative or the post-operative period. Um, immediate post-operatively and on AKT, a functional assessment was done using the functional independence measure score and the auspicity disability index score, with uh, a result of seven and zero to hundred percent being the best outcomes uh, in both. Our results showed that around 8 out of these 10 patients had already been initiated on preoperative AKT, 3 out of whom were started empirically and 2 who were, who were found to be defaulting. A targeted treatment was started postoperatively in 7 out of these 10 patients and drug sensitivity testing with a 14 drug sensitivity panel was done in 4 out of these 10 patients. 8 out of these 10 patients had received bidacolin for 6 months. We also found that uh, out of these 10 patients, eight had done very well functionally on a combined approach with surgery and uh, AKT with an FIM score of seven and an ODI score of zero to two percent. I would like to conclude by reiterating that the gold standard for the treatment of drug resistance to, uh, spinal tuberculosis is a biopsy. And I would also like to emphasize that if in the event that the uh, first, first CD guided biopsy done comes, comes out to be negative, then uh, attempting repetitive biopsies may be suggested or should be the way, way forward. And uh, in the event of rising drug resistant cases, we should consider doing a 14 drug sensitivity panel as far as possible for all patients. If appropriately treated with sensitive AKT for an adequate duration of time uh, and surgery were indicated, most of these patients do uh, end up with good functional outcomes. Thank you. And any questions? In such big abscesses, uh, is there any role of doing Instead of CT guided, can we do the biopsy with the J needle in the OR? Yeah. Uh, anyway, Dr. Nandini, it's a good paper. Thank you. Sir. There. Uh, <clears throat> I think the point she wanted to emphasize is that uh, even though uh, the scenario in which uh, she studied it, uh, that's San Hospital or a KM Hospital where you no, know, probably once you like ask for a CT guided biopsy, most of the time it lands. No, the patient lands up with no, negative to but the appointment by the time the appointment comes, yeah. it's usually one month or six weeks or sometimes even I've seen even up to three months. There, yeah. by the time you are giving that much time for the microbacteria to destroy even a further vertebra, so half the times we we'll land up with starting empirical equity, yeah. but uh, that's not the end end of it. That's why, right. because a few of the patients, even in my series also landed up with, in spite of being on empirical AKT, landed up with deficit. And so those 10 to 20% uh, they do are MDR, uh, this thing. One question I wanted to ask you is that out of your 10 patients, three of them are defaulters. Two of them are defaulters. Did you inquire whether they were taking it, uh, the proper doses, because one important reason for developing MDR is the improper doses you, you, like a weight related, the dosages and everything, it's important. Right. It's, so, so, so the repetitive biopsy, yes, I think uh, one CT guided fails, you repeat another CT guided, if not, try with a CM guided big board needle there. And if, I'll usually prefer uh, uh, scan the abdomen also, if there are any psoas abscess, if there are uh, paraspinal abscesses, is well and good. You can aspirate directly. But if there are any psoas sepsis or something, at least we can do an aspiration uh, uh, the pigtailing or something, and that will give you probably a more material there. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Nandi. The next talk is from Dr. Sushil. The study of correlation between fracture pattern, functional outcome, and pin <laughs> configuration in supracondylar humerus fracture in children as per back classification. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present in the Wirock Max 2022. So my topic is about study of correlation between fracture pattern, functional outcome, and pin configuration in supracondylar humerus fracture in children as per back classification. A pediatric supracondylar humerus fracture compromises 3% of all the pediatric fracture and is associated with say, clinically significant uh, complications such as neurolog neuro neurological injury, malunion, and uh, compartment syndrome. Wilkins modified Gartland classification system is most widely used classification system for this fracture, dividing them into three types based on their initial fracture displacement. Type 1, there is no displacement where it is treated conservatively uh, with uh, cast and type 2A where there is an intact posterior cortex hinged in extension, no rotation or translation. Type 2B, intact posterior cortex hinged in extension with some degree of rotational displacement or translation. In type 2 fractures, it is usually uh, treated conservatively or managed by surgically with pinning depending upon the degree of stability. Type 3, there is a complete displacement where it is treated with uh, surgical management by pinning. Bach et al. in 2008 revised the classification based on a fracture pattern in the coronal and sagittal plane and proposed, uh, proposed pin configuration specific to fracture pattern. The Bach classification is based on the angle the fracture line makes with the line perpendicular to the distal humeral axis. In the anterior posterior view, this is described as a coronal obliquity which is greater than or equal to 10 medial oblique or lateral oblique varieties. It is more associated with more combination and uh, rotational malalignment. In the lateral view, it is called a sagittal obliquity which is, where it is greater than 20, uh, it is high sagittal, it is associated with rotational malunion and also associated with, associated with other injuries. These are the uh, sketches of the coronal uh, fracture subtypes. In type A, which is called as a typical transverse fracture, where there is less than 10 degree of coronal obliquity with fracture plane entering and exiting near the epicondyles. In type 2, a lateral oblique fracture which where greater than 10 degree of coronal obliquity with proximal fracture plane exiting laterally. Type C, a medial oblique fracture with greater than 10 degrees of uh, coronal obliquity with proximal fracture plane exiting medially. In high fractures, a fracture plane entering and exiting above the olecranon fossa but within the distal humeral metaphysis. In sagittal fracture subtypes, in type A, with the low sagittal fracture, where the fracture plane is less than 20 degree. In high sagittal fracture, where the fracture plane is greater than 20 degree. The main aim, aim and objectives of my study are to compare the pin configuration done during close reduction and pinning in type 2 and type 3 supracondylar fracture of humerus in children with the age less than 14 years of age to that suggested by the Bach classification and to study the clinical outcome based on the Flynn criteria and its correlation with the concordance of the pin configuration between execution and has suggested by the Bach classification. Multidimensional method, uh, my study is retroprospective study where total number of 40 patients was uh, used uh, without neurovascular complications. Inclusion criteria uh, supraconal fractures without neurovascular complications, age less than 14 years of uh, both sexes. Gartland type 2 and type 3 fractures were used. Exclusion criteria fracture more than 3 days old, patient type 1 Gartland fracture, open fractures associated with other uh, fractures in the ipsilateral upper lip, patient with history of deformity, contracture, or any neuro deficit in the ipsilateral upper limb before the trauma. A functional outcome were based on the modified Clinch criteria and also the radiological outcome based on the Bowman's angle the anterior humeral line. Uh, the clinical, uh, the pin configuration was determined as per uh, suggested by the Bach et al. Uh, there was two lateral pin for the typical transfer and uh, a lateral oblique and in la sagittal view low transfer and mid cross pinning for the medial oblique fracture. Uh, three lateral pin if the uh, all the pins if possible that all three pins are uh, good purchase in the proximal fragment or two lateral pin and one medial pin in the high transverse fracture and the high sagittal fractures these are the some examples uh, where it shows the first image shows the uh, typical transverse fracture where the two lateral pins 
are used and uh, lateral oblique fracture two lateral pins are used uh, in medial oblique fracture cross pinning was done with a uh, two lateral pin and one medial pin and high transfer fracture there was three lateral uh, two two lateral pin and one uh, medial pin was used in low sagittal two pins was used and in high sagittal three pins were used observation and result uh, age distribution of the patient in study uh, there is the average age group is around uh, 7 years uh, in gender distribution uh, the fifth, in 25 patients were male and 15 patients were female there was a male predominance uh, mode of injury most of the uh, children came with a fall while playing second was the fall from the height and third of the cycling side involved right side was more involved than the left side uh, gartland type fracture in our series of 40 patients 16 patients, 40% uh, were, were affected by type 2 and 24 patients, that is 60%, were affected by type 3 supraconular humerus fracture. Uh, frequency of fracture type in our study, where typical transfer fracture we observed around 18 uh, patients, lateral oblique uh, 11 and middle oblique 7 patients, high transfers uh, 4 and total in total of 40 patients and low sagittal around 20, 18 patients and high sagittal 22 patients. Uh, distribution of uh, pin configuration uh, there was uh, one lateral pin on one middle pin in three uh, patient two lateral pin in 10 patient two lateral pin and one middle pin in eight patients three lateral pin in four patient out of 40 patients a uh, distribution of pin configuration has per bar classification where uh, pin configuration has per bar at all uh, suggested and what we have done in our study uh, so in high transfers and high sagittal it was suggested for three lateral pin or two lateral pin plus one middle pin uh, we have done uh, two lateral pin and two middle pin in a three patient in high transfers and low sagittal uh, it was suggested a three lateral pin or two lateral pin uh, plus one middle pin we have done two lateral pin plus one middle pin in lateral oblique and high sagittal uh, eight patients uh, were were suggested eight patients we have done two lateral pin and one middle pin uh, in eight patients uh, in, uh, out of eight patients six patients we have done two lateral pin and one middle pin and uh, two lateral pin two middle pin in one patient three lateral pin in uh, one patient sir. lateral oblique and low sagittal uh, three uh, patients were done two lateral pin and one middle pin in cross pinning in middle oblique and high sagittal uh, out of three patients, two were done, two lateral pin and one middle pin and uh, two lateral pin and two middle pin in three patients. In middle oblique and low sagittal, uh, cross pinning was done, uh, one uh, lateral pin and one middle pin. In typical high transverse and high sagittal, uh, two patients, uh, one patient was done, two lateral pin and two patients was done, uh, two lateral pin and one middle pin and three lateral pin in three patients. A typical transverse, uh, low sagittal fracture, two lateral pin. Uh, so one one lateral pin one middle pin in one patient and two lateral pin in ten patient and two lateral pin and one middle pin in one patient so uh, we have done uh, 13 uh, patients over fixation and right fixation we was done in 26 patient and under fixation was done in one patient out of 40 patients uh, reduction uh, most of the 39 patient uh, were done in close reduction and one patient was done in the open reduction uh, range of motion was uh, observed for the follow up of 3 weeks, 6 weeks, 3 months and 6 months and uh, for uh, range of motion loss at final follow up was also taken. Uh, there is a change, change in carrying angle uh, was range from 0 to uh, 6 degree average being uh, 2.35 degree. Uh, cha uh, change in Bowman's angle was compared at immediate post reduction post union. Uh, 27 modified fly, uh, flynn criteria to evaluate outcome of treatment grading uh, 27 out of 40 patient had a carrying angle loss of 0 to 4.9 degree which was considered to be an excellent reason 10 patient had a 5 degree to 9.9 uh, 9 degree which was considered to be a good result uh, 3 patient had 10 to 15 degree which was considered to be an fair result majority of our uh, cases had an excellent result and good all patients shows flynn criteria satisfactory uh, complications uh, out of 40 patients, uh, there were three patients were superficial pin tract infection was present, and uh, three patients there was a pin insertion ulnar palsy which was uh, recalled within uh, three months, and one patient with a cubitus virus deformity. Uh, rest other or good. Uh, conclusion of my study is uh, the present study shows that type two and type three uh, displaced supraconular humerus fracture in children can be underfixed or overfixed if the bar classification is not applied. The knowledge of bar classification helps in optimum pin configuration and uh, fixation for management of this fracture. 
of the sort. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, the next talk is by Dr. Ahmed in Clinical Radiological Predictors Determining Outcome in Spinal TB. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this talk is basically uh, about kind of radiological predictors determining the outcome in spinal tuberculosis. So it's basically a pool of 60 patients uh, done a prospective study between 280 and 220. Half of them were uh, underwent conservative treatment, the others went surgery. Uh, basically every patient went into a physical exam, uh, with a neurological exam. We looked into the presenting uh, symptoms, uh, functionality, and VAS scores. We used multiple uh, ways to assess this. And after treatment, we followed up with the patients over an interval of time of six weeks, three months, six months, and one year. And we also looked into the radiological aspect, uh, looking for destruction, involvement of multiple vertebras, and looking for, um, and looking for any changes along the way. So we included all patients with dose and lumbar um, involvement, uh, all ages, pregnant patients were removed, Patients with cervical involvement were removed, as, along with any other spinal tumors. Uh, what took us into conservative treatment? Basically, patients with no spinal instability, uh, no, uh, no massive uh, kyphosis uh, or deformity. We chose operative for patients who have neurologic complications, who have a failed conservative treatment, uh, some kind of an um, active infection, or progression of symptoms or neurological problems. So what did we observe? We observed that uh, the prevalence is um, mostly uh, the first three decades of, of uh, life. Uh, males and females do not make a difference. Functionality, basically we took the uh, majority of patients with a functional uh, first uh, onset um, and after treatment, it, we, sh we see that every patient became completely functional. On the other aspect, uh, surgically, uh, surgical patients were picked out, the ones who are non-functional, and we did have a huge uh, uh, improvement in the results and the functionality of uh, most of our patients. When it comes to neurology, um, we can see that the patients who, had, uh, who went to conservative treatment uh, resolved completely uh, with an E, uh, given E as the uh, as neurological symptoms or signs. Um, for the surgical patients, um, lots of improvements, statistically uh, significant, uh, but there remains uh, a few patients who did not make it to um, uh, with better neurology. Cobb's angle, uh, statistically insignificant increase in Cobb's angle. Uh, 0 0.1 degree for conservative patients, but on the other half, the operative patients, uh, a major uh, decrease in Cobb's angle post-surgery uh, from 27 degrees to 14 degrees. The ODI, similar to the VAS score, uh, completely uh, shows uh, an improvement for both uh, pools of patients, the conservative and the surgical. Uh, these are the complications on both uh, pools of patients. Uh, so there has been uh, older, similar um, papers done before, and they all showed the same um, results that whatever you do, uh, patients will uh, get will improve. The main thing is to start uh, the therapy, make it medical or surgical. What we're trying to do in this uh, topic here is trying to find out the factors that we should look at uh, to optimize the treatment. As long as you start the treatment um, with the anti-TB um, management, uh, then you're in good track. Some uh, patients need more help and, and more aggressive uh, therapy based on specific uh, factors. 
Um, we uh, have realized that there are limitations to the study. First is that each patient came with um, different uh, onset of symptoms, which might have been a bias since lots of the symptoms are um, object, uh, subjective. And we use all posterior fusion instrumentation in all our patients, uh, so we can't really differentiate between different um, types of surgical approaches. Um, so in my conclusion, um, based on this uh, uh, paper, there has been lots of other new papers followed, especially from the Japanese side, uh, talking more about in details about uh, these uh, six points, how to use them to assess clinically if you're taking your patient into, into the OT or not. Uh, so first is an age, um, some are discussing under eight years um, or uh, under 15, which you should have a bit of a less of a, a tendency for surgery, uh, especially if you have a high kyphosis over 30 degrees. And we have seen that in this paper. Uh, VAS, if it's not getting better, even uh, four to six weeks after conservative treatment, Maybe it's a good candidate for surgery, radiological instability, the stasis. Um, similarly, uh, radiological destruction, uh, involvement of two or more vertebras. Uh, posterior involvement causing instability is also something you should take care and take into consideration. Neurology, um, again, watching the patient, uh, keeping up, following up uh, a few weeks after uh, treatment. If there's no improvement, you go for a surgery. Thank you. Any questions for this? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my topic for today is a prospective observational study of pin track infection in external fixation from a tertiary healthcare center. So it is already well established that pin track infection is the most common complication of external fixator use. So the, and the prevalence of pin track infection as per published literature is anywhere around 20 to 30 percent. But due to a lack of universally accepted definition and methods of reporting, uh, there are discrepancies in reported versus true cases. The risk factors for these infections can be divided as patient factors and surgical factors. Patient factors such as age, comorbidities, type of wound, etc. And surgical factors such as pin insertion techniques, pre-dilling, pre-tapping, etc. These infections have a wide range of complications that can go from uh, minor minor complications like redness, erythema, wound discharge, to major complications like necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis, and toxic shock, uh, toxic shock syndrome. The objectives for the study was to ident identify the prevalence of pin tract infection, uh, to identify the grades of pin tract infection, also the risk factors and outcomes of these infections. This was a prospective observational cohort study that was undertaken in the Department of Orthopedics at Bharti Hospital, a tertiary healthcare center and teaching institution in Pune. This was a two-year study which was from October 2020 to October 2022 and included a total of 22 patients and 112 pins. We included men and women between 18 to 70 years of age, uh, emergency and elective surgeries both, all type of frame constructs and all long bones. We also included both open and closed fractures for, this, for the study. Uh, we excluded Elizaro wing fixator and uh, Taylor spatial frame from the study. And uh, the frequency of data collection was day one, th day three, day seven, three weeks, six weeks, three months, and six months if required. The classification for pin tract infection used for the study was the Check It Autobone classification, which basically divided pin tract infection into uh, six grades. The first three being uh, minor infections and, the, and four to six being major grades of infection. And the basic differentiation between these two grades was that for major infection, the external fixator had to be abandoned. 
Uh, grade 1 infection is slight redness and a little discharge which settles with dressings. Grade 2 is uh, associated with soft tissue ten uh, tenderness but settles with a short course of antibiotic. Uh, in grade 3 infection, the pins need to be recited. Grade 4 infection is associated with uh, multiple pin loosening and the ex external fixator has to be ab abandoned. Grade 5 infection has uh, radiographic features of osteomyelitis and uh, grade 6 infection is what occurs after removal of the external fixator where there is skin breakdown and uh, formation of sequestrum. Coming to the observational and uh, results, so the mean age for the patients was 49.7 uh, years and uh, there were 16 males and 6 female uh, patients included in the study. Three patients were diabetic, three hypertensive and uh, four had other comorbidities. The sites for pinning were six patients with an isolated tibia fracture, uh, six patients with the uh, delta frame which included pinning of the tibia and calcaneum, uh, one patient for femur plus tibia, uh, five proximal humerus and uh, four radius and first metacarpal. Ten of the patients had uh, closed fractures and twelve were compound fractures, the most common being compound grade 2 and compound grade 3b, which were four uh, patients respectively. Nine patients had a uniplanar fixator, six had a delta frame, five umex, one biplanar and one hybrid. So out of the 22 patients, 21 had some grade of infection and the rate of pintract infection found was 45.5% with a total of 51 pins out of 112 that were infected. All the infections were minor and the X-fix did not have to be abandoned for either of these patients. Uh, the rate of pintract infection in the calcaneum was 100% which is all six of them that were infected. 47.5% uh, for the tibia, 40% for humerus, 40% uh, for radius and 10% for uh, first metacarpal respectively. These are just some clinical pictures of the grades of infections that we can see. The rate of infection also varied by frame from 5% to 35%, the most common being the uniplanar and delta fixator. All the pin site infections resolved with the use of antibiotics except for one patient with a minor grade 3 infection in whom the external fixator was removed and amputation was performed not for the pin tract infection but uh, for reasons uh, relating to the original wound state which was a compound grade 3B wound. There was a significant positive correlation reported between the number of pin site infections and the duration of external fixator in weeks. There was no significant correlation found between the number and grade of pin site infection, type of wound, duration of antibiotic cover, compliance with home de uh, dressings and, or any other factors. So coming to the take home message is that the rate of pin tract infection was around 45.5% as per the study. All the infections were minor grade, uh, almost all the calcaneum pins were infected and the only positive risk factor identified for infection was the duration of external fixator and comorbidities of the patient, type of wound, duration of antibiotic, type of pin used or compliance of the patient with home dressings had no bearing on the rate of pin tract infection. Uh, I'd also like to highlight some limitations of this study. Uh, the first limitation is the sample size, which is 112 pins but only 22 patients, which is relatively small. And also we have included both closed and open fractures in the study. So those are the two limitations. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Pooja.